Hello, everyone. I think we should might as well get started. Um, I want to introduce myself. I am Becky Bartovix, and I um, I use she, her pro pronouns. Um, I live on uh, the occupied uh, Penobscot territory of now known as North Haven Island. Um, and I am a longtime Sierra Club volunteer. Um, and I wanted to just start by uh, recognizing or acknowledging that we all live on Wabanaki uh, occupied territory. Um, and in fact, um, Sears Island was certainly occupied by uh, Penobscot natives. Um, the Zoom rules, uh, because we're expecting a large crowd, we decided to accept uh, question and answers um, after both Rolf and, um, and Steve Miller speak. Um, and uh, David Von Segren will be um, helping me manage the question and answers, um, or the questions, and we'll pose them to um, both David and, and, I mean, to Rolf and Steve. Um, Sierra Club has been involved with uh, working to uh, protect Sears Island and the resources that it pro provides, um, ecological resources to the Bay. This is a wonderful picture that Rolf has up and he will talk more about that. But we've been doing this for more than 35 years. Um, it is among the largest islands on the coast, along the coast, east coast of the United States. And um, certainly one of, close to the largest island that's undeveloped on uh, in Maine. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Rolf Olson um who is the uh works who, who is a volunteer for friends of sears island and um rolf do you want to go ahead all right thanks very much becky really appreciate this opportunity to help people understand what's going on and uh, try to take some action as well i think to start I'd like to set the stage, as most of you probably know, the state of Maine would like to build, a, a, create a floating wind farm about 30 miles offshore in the Gulf of Maine. For this to happen, a port or actually a system of ports is required first to manufacture and launch the floating wind turbines and then to service and maintain them after they go into the production of energy. The largest of the ports that is needed to be built is called a marshalling port. And this is where they'll bring together all the materials, the towers, the blades, they will put all the pieces together. Um, and it uh, requires at least a hundred acres, probably more of flat land that is adjacent to deep water. And there can be no aerial obstructions at all between the marshalling port and the deployment site in the Gulf of Maine. This is obviously an illustration of, it's not pretending to be Sears Island or anything, but it's showing you what we're talking about. And that's really a, you know, a facility that might rival a Bath Ironworks in size and scope with a massive crane that can reach high enough to assemble the bases and the towers that'll rise several hundred feet in the air. These are large, large pieces. To offer you a sense of scale, uh, 20 megawatts or more are the turbine sizes that are being planned for the project in the Gulf of Maine. So those would be higher than the 12 megawatt towers you see that's just to the left of One World Trade Center and shorter than the 50 megawatt towers depicted at the far right. And that yellow line you see on the screen is just about 200 feet above the sea level, and that represents the highest point on Sears Island. In the current plan, there are two towns on the main coast that meet the criteria for the marshalling port, Sears Port and East Port. And Maine DOT has presented four possible scenarios. Three of them are located in Sears Port and one in East Port. Sears Port's the focus of our discussion this evening since it appears that Maine DOT has exhibited a very strong preference for building the marshalling port on Sears Island, which of course is owned by the state of Maine. And as Becky said, it's 
one of the largest undeveloped islands on the eastern seaboard of the U.S. The other feasible option in Searsport is on Mac Point, and that, as many people will know, is currently an operating port operated by Sprague, owned by Sprague, and it's been an industrial site for more than a century. And to us, Mac Point makes the most sense, and that's the proposition we're going to be exploring today. Many of you are familiar with the, the map of Sears Island. Uh, so I'll offer first an overview of Sears Island, its natural, recreational, historical, cultural, and other value. And then Steve's will, Steve will present the case for building on Mac Point, and he'll have other, other points as well, I'm sure. And then after that, we'll have time for questions and discussion. You can see on the map how the island is divided into the conservation area, which is the left-hand side of the map, the, the top and the left-hand side. It's about two-thirds of the island. And the transportation parcel is that darker shaded place on the right, which as part of the agreement back in 2007, 2008, has been reserved by the state of Maine in the, in the name of the Department of Transportation for possible future transportation uses. Uh, as Becky said, we're all living on Wabanaki land and indigenous peoples of the Wabanaki nations called the island Wasamkeg, meaning bright sand beach. And it served as a visual navigation beacon as they migrated seasonally over land and water for 3,400 years or even more before Europeans arrived and claimed the land for themselves. Around 1730, so early in this nation's history, the island became known as Brigadier's Island, named for Samuel Waldo, who was a Brigadier General and the namesake for Waldo County. The island has passed through multiple owners. Uh, in 1794, Henry Knox hired people to turn much of the island into grazing farm for oxen, cattle, sheep, and hogs. He also built a farmhouse, the remains of which are still visible just off the homestead trail. By 1806, several men owned shares in Brigadier's Island. And in 1813, David Sears bought out his partners and the island became known as Sears Island. Farming continued on Sears Island for more than a century. While the Sears family never lived year round on the island, they did build a summer home there at the southern, near the southern end in 1853 that burned 40 years later, but the foundation stones for the, for the homestead and also an outbuilding remain. In 1905, Bangor Investment Company, part of Bangor and Rustic Railroad, bought the island to develop a resort, which was never built. And farming the land ultimately proved not to be successful. So in 1934, the vacant buildings were demolished and the island, as the island returned to a more natural state, local people really viewed it as a public recreation area. And they even used it as a drop-off point for smuggling liquor during prohibition. So over more than 50 years since the 1970s, there have been several plans to industrialize Sears Island. A nuclear power plant, an oil refinery, an aluminum smelting plant, an LNG terminal, and a cargo port. All were tried and ultimately rejected for environmental and other reasons, but only after first stirring up considerable local discord. Sears Island continues to be a thriving terrestrial and marine habitat. Uh, it's a very popular birding site. Birders have reported more than 20, 225 species uh, spotted on Sears Island. And you can see that's 47% of all the bird species recorded in the state of Maine. It's a hotspot on eBird.org and a gem of Maine coastal birding in the region. And that's a quote from a book called Bird Watching in Maine. Sears Island is surrounded by eelgrass beds, especially on the western side of the island where the development would occur. Eelgrass serves as a nursery for fish, lobsters, urchins, clams, mussels, marine snails, and other mollusks. 
And once eelgrass beds are destroyed, they have a very difficult time coming back and they take with them all the species that they nurtured. This slide illustrates that purple block and the green area uh, show where the proposed wind port might be located on Sears Island. And it's overlaid on a map that shows a variety of wildlife habitat areas. And, and it's an area of pretty dense forest and it includes wetlands and streams as well. All over the island, there are many large legacy trees among the maritime spruce fir and mature hardwood forests, and they provide habitat to birds, mammals, invertebrates, and understory plants. The vernal pools, they are a never ending source of amazement to the kids in our science squad program. And I'm always quite amazed by the sound volume when the peepers start up each spring. Sears Island has really become an important learning lab for people of all ages, but maybe especially for children. And the programs that are offered by Friends of Sears Island have become extremely popular over the last several years, providing a really rich dimension to what kids learn in the classroom or in homeschool situations. And they're all offered by, they're free or by donation. Sears Island has become an engine for tourism and the economy in more recent years as, as it's become better known in the region and beyond. More people have visited each year. We have a traffic counter on the island for three years, courtesy of Maine DOT. So we can see that during the summer, you know, we see 34,000 plus people in the summer. Uh, whenever I'm on the island and I see people standing at the map kiosk, I ask them where they're from. And I've met people from many different states, several foreign countries, England, France, Germany, Australia, Japan, just to name a few. And people come you know, to Sears Island and they leave with great memories of, of visiting Maine. Um, on a recent visit, I met a couple from Washington DC at the very south end of the, the island on the, uh, uh, what we call the scenic lookout trail. And he's a, a diplomat, didn't say what sort of diplomat, but clearly distinguished people. And I asked them how they came to visit Sears Island. And they said they did a Google search to find a place where they would stay for three or four days and not have to travel far to enjoy great food, some art and culture, some outdoor activities. <clears throat> so they stayed at Captain Nichols Inn in Searsport, which is a wonderful place. They ate at some of the best re restaurants in Belfast and Searsport. Uh, they went to Hay Sailor, which was noted in Down East Magazine as one of the best new restaurants in the state. Um, Marshall Wharf Brewery in, in, in Belfast. They, they really enjoyed themselves. And they said they'd think about retiring in a place like this. So how will the experience of visiting Sears Island change with an industrial port there? There will certainly be much more traffic over the causeway with heavy trucks and maybe several hundred workers coming and going every day. It's possible a new rail line over the causeway could be needed. Will there be new utility infrastructure, wires to bring power to the manufacturing process? Will visitors experience the same tranquility they've come to expect on the beaches and trails? Will as many people visit the island? And none of this can be known yet, but it feels pretty safe to me to say that the experience of visiting Sears Island will be significantly diminished if the wind port is built there. So here's the, the question, you know, can a conservation area successfully coexist with a busy, noisy, manufacturing port. And there's no simple path forward. There's no doubt that a very challenging process to decide lies ahead, although you know we'll, we'll know more in the coming weeks. Difficult decisions will be made that are, are undoubtedly going to leave some people disappointed or even angry. Um, I believe what we need to do is find the pathway forward that offers the greatest benefit in terms of finding a pathway to renewable energy resources while presenting the fewest possible obstacles. And I believe that site is on Mac Point for the wind port. 
And so now Steve will share his screen and I'll stop mine and Steve will take over. And Steve Miller is a longtime supporter of Sears Island. And uh, he is uh, also with Islesboro Island Trust. And I would like to hand it over to Steve. And can you uh, turn on your video? And your audio. At the moment, I'm right here, but I'm trying to get my uh, my uh, slides up for you. Okay, great. And let's see. Just one more minute, and I'm going to hit share screen. Does that work? Yes. There it is. Okay. Well, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Becky and and Rolf and Sierra Club Maine for uh, organizing this this event this evening. And I want to apologize to you all because I really haven't had the opportunity to present anywhere near as elegant a uh, discussion as as Rolf just just did. It's going to seem a little bit jumbled because. Um, I really had to just cobble together a whole bunch of different desperate pieces of information, but I think it's information that you might find useful. I also hope that during the this evening, uh, if you aren't already, that you become convinced of three things. First, that Sears Island's current undeveloped natural condition provides important ecological services to the region and the state, especially for fisheries. Secondly, uh, once begun, uh, we believe, and I hope that you become convinced that the proposed development at Sears Island opens the door for expansive industrialization of Penobscot Bay, radically altering up to, and probably more than 300 acres of the island's 940 acres and changing the entire Penobscot watershed forever. And thirdly, the build out and industrialized Mac Point consolidates industry in one location, economizes on existing infrastructure and replaces and remediates some of Mac Point's past outdated coal, oil, and gas history. Islesboro Islands Trust supports the development of an offshore wind facility at Mac Point and opposes development of that facility on Sears Island if any such facility is to be built in Penobscot Bay. I'm gonna first provide a little background to some Maine Department of Transportation promises about Sears Island I'll then share some information that I think uh, pretty clearly indicates that Maine Department of Transportation has been pursuing development of Sears Island instead of Mac Point all along and why that seems so nonsensical. I'm really looking forward to questions and answers uh, and discussions uh, after this to perhaps help clarify what's going to seem like a jumbled presentation, I'm afraid. So for a little bit of background, you know, we all understand that climate change is the most serious challenge facing us all. I think we all understand that. Islesboro Islands Trust certainly understands that and supports and is engaged in efforts to address climate change, including renewable energy. But siting renewable energy facilities can and should be undertaken with great care. Something called the Sears Island Planning Initiative, acronym is SIPI, uh, put together or, or came to a consensus agreement, including promises made by all parties. And those parties included the Maine Department of Transportation. Governor Baldashi uh, convened the Sears Island Planning Initiative in 2006. Uh, about 50 stakeholders participated and of those 38 signed the consensus agreement, which was dated April 12th, 2007. And that included signature by then Department of Transportation Commissioner David Cole. There are three things from that consensus agreement I wanna draw attention to. The first, and I'm quoting, Matt Point shall be given preference as an alternative to port development on Sears Island. That's about as unambiguous, I think, as you can possibly get. Map Point shall be given preference as an alternative to port development on Sears Island. And secondly, the agreement included a fairly extensive list of things that would not occur, that everybody agreed should not occur on Sears Island. Things like LNG terminals and so forth. But one of those on that list was no soil harvesting. And the third uh, finding in the agreement is uh, that I wanna draw attention to, 
It is understood that none of the parties are endorsing in advance any proposal for a marine transportation facility. All stakeholders reserve the right to object to certain kinds of facilities. To date, the Moffat and Nickel report, and which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second here, uh, and the Maine Department of Transportation public and internal communications all show preference for Sears Island as a location for offshore wind facility and not Matt Point. The current plan for Sears Island would entail harvesting 1,215,000 cubic yards of earth from Sears Island. Failure to give present preference to Mag Point and proposing to harvest more than 1 million cubic yards of soil from Sears Island clearly violates promises made by the Maine Department of Transportation through the Sears Island planning initiatives and raises huge questions about trust. Although there are public statements to the contrary, those notwithstanding, the Maine Department of Transportation clearly show that they have promoted development of the proposed offshore wind facility on Sears Island for months and really perhaps for years before the November 2021 release of Moffat and Nickel report. Further evidence from our Freedom of Access Act request uh, related to this uh, show that uh, Sears Island has always been the Maine Department of Transportation's preferred alternative for this particular facility. Uh, one example is that in March of 2021, way months before the Moffat and Nickel report was even made public, a memo, an internal memo from uh, the Department of Transportation called for, and I quote, request for information to explore potential for partnerships that would focus on primary site Sears Island. So internally, Department of Transportation has understood and been uh, working towards the primary site for this development on Sears Island. Just yesterday, we discovered yet another example of this commitment to develop Sears Island. It's in a stakeholder management plan, which was written and undertaken by Kay Rand on behalf of the Maine Department of Transportation. That document cites the goal as, and I quote, a commitment to pursue development of Sears Island as the renewable energy port of the Northeast and announce a statewide port strategy spanning the entire coast to provide auxiliary roles to position Maine as a national leader in the offshore wind industry. That goal is here in what you see in that uh, slide are uh, portions of the uh, email and the uh, management plan. So the Moffat and Nickel report was issued in November of 2021. And in that they found that, and I quote, both the Mac Point and Sears Island sites can achieve or surpass the minimum required offshore wind port criteria. On the other hand, that report went on to recommend that a marine terminal on Sears Island should be the centralized hub for assembly and launching of floating foundations, as well as erection of the wind turbine generated components onto the foundation. That Moffat and Nickel explicitly and formally recommended construction of the needed manufacturing, assembling and launching facility on Sears Island, especially when they acknowledged that such a facility could be built at Mac Point was in our view, just simply outrageous. But given some of the internal communications we've read since then, it was not that surprising. So where are we now at this point in time? There is no formal application being made for development of the offshore wind facility to manufacture, assemble, and launch offshore wind turbines. However, um, uh, Department of Transportation and the main uh, uh, governor's office of energy have both made it very clear that they are working on applications for that facility and that we should expect those to be forthcoming. The Moffat and Nickel report actually had a section outlining what the permitting process would look like. It is extensive. <clears throat> and uh, we 
have significant evidence that federal agencies will require mitigation for Sears Island destruction. One of the things that we're quite happy about is that Isla Bennett, who was formerly with the Environmental Protection Agency during the cargo port proposal back in the 1990s, um, and is now with the Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, has joined our strategic uh, discussions about how to proceed and will be uh, in a position to help uh, lobby federal agencies to in fact take a hard look at any application that cites Sears Island as a preferred alternative for development. Attempting to get permits, it's going to be time consuming and it's going to be costly, but even if successful, it, it will require extensive and enormous amounts of mitigation, which will further add to costs. Back in 1996, the US Fish and Wildlife Service said of Sears Island, and I quote, rocky intertidal mudflat and salt marsh habitats provide feeding areas for an assortment of shore and wading birds including a long list of different species that includes uh, eelgrass beds, provide highly productive feeding areas for waterfowl that eat fish and shellfish. Surveys of the intertidal and subtidal habitats in the project area show very high levels of biological productivity, including softshell clam, rock crab, American lobster, sand shrimp, pollock, menhaden, winter flounder, sea urchin, and starfish all of which are critical components of the food web at Sears Island. There is simply no way to overestimate uh, the importance of Sears Island to the Penobscot Bay watershed and the ec ecology. Um, and this has been borne out by review of Sears Island in the past. We can expect that level of review uh, going forward. Uh, Miles Rylands Trust hired Dawson and Associates, um, consulting company, uh, com uh, comprised actually largely of former Army Corps of Engineers uh, personnel to take a look at the Moffat and Nickel report. And they report that um, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's main coastal islands national wildlife refuge favors keeping Sears Island in its current natural condition. The US FWS remains supportive of the continued protection of Sears Island. The refuge stands ready to assist in review of any proposal presented to the public. Uh, after that, uh, after Dawson had contacted uh, folks uh, earlier this year, uh, Friends of Maine Coastal Islands issued a letter in support in, in August. The letter says in part, we, the trustees of the Friends of Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge, hereby support the Isles Islands Trust in their rejection of development on Sears Island, Searsport, Maine. They concluded that maintaining Sears Island in its current condition is essential. So one of the things that concerns us the most is the industrialization of Penobscot Bay that could, and I think we should expect would uh, occur if the door is open to developing any kind of port on Sears Island. Uh, even back in 19, uh, excuse me, back in 2017, uh, uh, Maine Port Authority said, and I quote, Sears Port represents one of the most flexible and adaptable port facilities in the Northeast Sears Island could be used for project cargo, specialized production or assembly of offshore wind components or neo bulk cargo. So that was in 2017. We believe that this latest industrialization threat is uh, actually is disguised as a green project. In fact, the Moffat and Nickel report lists possibilities for expansion as I'm showing here as the top criteria for the recommendation to build the offshore facility on Sears Island rather than Mac Point. In fact, uh, Matt Burns, who is the main port authority executive director and a primary spokesperson uh, for the offshore wind manufacturing, assembling and launching facility on more than one occasion, 
while promoting the Moffat and Nickel report and its findings referenced the likelihood of additional industrial and commercial development at Sears Island following construction of the offshore wind facility there. Remember, we're talking about over 300 acres. On the other hand, Mac Point is already industrialized. Building here consolidates heavy industry in a single location. Offshore wind at Mac Point would repurpose a portion of an outdated industrial facility with energy development for the future. The area outlined in black was uh, determined by Moffat and Nickel to be available um, for the offshore wind uh, facility and uh, uh, Sprague Energy is, is agreeable. The preferred location at Mac Point is over here, which actually historically supported two commercial piers. Developing offshore wind at Mac Point will entail safe remediation and Sprig Energy confirms cooperation and accommodation for this. If we could convince the Mills administration of the points that Rolf and I have been trying to make this evening, we would save everyone time and money. I've got to admit that I'm not terribly optimistic. However, we really must try. But meanwhile, we also need to prepare for the far more likely scenario that Sears Island will continue to be the state's preferred alternative when they enter the permitting process. I hope you are convinced that Mac Point should be the location if any offshore wind facility is built in Penobscot Bay and that Sears Island should be protected in its present natural state. So what can you do? Uh, the Islesboro Select Board adopted a resolution saying among other things that the best offshore wind manufacturing launching location must be a careful process weighing a wide range of social, cultural, and environmental factors. And they concluded that Matt Point can and should be the preferred location. You could let others know about your position, including US Fish and Wildlife Service, National Marine Fisheries Service, and your federal, state, and local governmental representatives. I draw your attention down here to a Friends of Sears Island offshore wind uh, resources page, which I think you would find quite helpful. I'm hoping that uh, we have left sufficient time for questions and discussions and that you can uh, thereby help make sense of what I've been trying to <laughs> jumble through here. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, and thanks everybody for listening. Um, I, uh, if you look in the chat, there are two other two opportunities for signing a petition. Um, we uh, there's the one from uh, uh, Protect Sears Island, which is the Friends of Sears Island petition. We have an add up campaign, um, which will allow us to communicate with you when we um, have a, a, a press conference to deliver the petitions to the governor. Um, and, and that will probably be in the, uh, in the new year. Um, but you can also reach out to either Friends of Sears Island or Sears, uh, or Sierra Club or Islesboro Island Trust um, to let us know if you'd like us to keep you, um, in, you know, included in any information going forward. Um, I think there, there was a question that came through um, from Peter Shapiro. And um, I think it was had to do with, um, you know, what from an industrial perspective, you know, why, what, in what ways is Sears Island a better site than Mac Point? And I think that he, you know, he said that the next slide kind of gave that answer, but um, I think we might just take a couple of seconds to respond to that question. Um, and um, yeah, I've got a couple of thoughts on that, if you don't great, mind. Great, wonderful, good. You know, one, one of them is, you know, there are, there are as, as Steve mentioned, you know, criteria, and I think I touched on it as well, what makes a good place for it. And you know, a big thing is large amounts of flat land adjacent to deep water. And, you know, Mac Point fits that. Fits that. It's, some of it's occupied now by tanks and other buildings that would have to be either taken down or, or moved. Sears Island represents 335 acres of land that could be flattened. And in order to flatten it, they will be needing, again, as Steve mentioned, to carve out a big portion of that Western edge um, and then compact it to 
you know, it would severely change the, the, the landscape, but it makes it better in that it's, there's nothing there now except for trees and, and, and dirt. So it's, and the state owns it. So there's no issue of, you know, figuring out who do we need to contact to either buy the land or lease the land or make it available to us. Steve has some thoughts too, I see. Well, I just thought it might make sense to go the other way and to mention that um, during the permitting process, especially ne uh, NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act uh, review, um, there will need to be a determination as to which of several options. Uh, well, first of all, the application has to identify several options for developing a, uh, a offshore wind facility. And then uh, we'll have to determine which is the least environmentally damaging. And I think it's pretty clear to all of us that there is just hands down, no real question about that, that uh, indeed the Matt Point is the least environmentally damaging option. Um, I wanted to just, uh, let's see, there are a couple of questions that have come in. Um, the question about dredging, um, when people, when uh, this person, Jennifer Craig, you know, speaks to people, they talk about the need to dredge Mac Point um, and not Sears Island. And I, I just want to say I, I do participate in the state um, or the uh, actually the Army Corps of Engineers uh, dredging calls and Sears port has to be dredged frequently. So this is not something that uh, doesn't happen. Um, and because, partly because of the, you know, the river bringing sludge down the river um, and it depositing there rather than circulating around um, Sears Island and going out um, since we now have a causeway that stops it. Um, but, the, but there is always dredging there. So the question is how much dredging would be needed for Mac Point? And I don't know if either of you wanna um, mention that or uh, I can go on but I'm not part of the offshore wind port advisory group. So one of the you two can bring that to answer that question. Well, um, thanks, Becky. Uh, not because I'm part of the offshore wind uh, public advisory group, but because uh, that really hasn't been discussed there particularly, but, uh, but the Moffat and Nickel report suggests that a substantial amount of dredging would need to be done over at Mac Point in order for the uh, uh, key to be built over there as they have envisioned it which was uh, sort of parallel to the shore. But, um, but the thing is that um, uh, it's our understanding that uh, those uh, sediments could be uh, brought ashore and uh, deposited in an upland location. Uh, if it's suitable to be uh, repurposed, they can mix it with uh, one component or another, uh, concrete and so forth, and actually use that sediment uh, safely. Uh, I think so it isn't in our view so much a question of whether there should be any dredging or not uh, in order to utilize that point, um, but whether or not that's a significant enough factor to, to make it uh, say the least environmentally damaging. But uh, there's every reason to believe that the sediment is not highly contaminated. Right now there's a proposal to do maintenance dredging in the entryway and the sediments there have been found suitable for uh, disposal in an upland location. In, in other words, they aren't terribly contaminated. So uh, I think there's reason to be hopeful that that would be the case with these other sediments um, and that uh, uh, they could be reused. So uh, it, it's costly, there's no question about that. Um, and it's a factor that needs to be considered and, and approached carefully. But I also want to stress when uh, we were looking at the possibility of a huge, huge uh, uh, widening and, and lengthening of the entryway area uh, for Mac Point because of an interest in, in larger ships coming in. Uh, uh, again, worked with Dawson Associates and found that dredging at the piers would, would satisfy those interests. And so we were in a position of actually encouraging dredging at the piers in order to keep this small sort of niche market kind of port open. So uh, I think that uh, uh, there's not, there's reason to be cautious about dredging, but not a reason to be fearful about dredging. And so then uh, the next thing was um, question from Edward Hodder, uh, Cotter is that, um, is it accurate to say that the only reason the state prefers Sears Island are related to cost? And um, yeah, why don't you take that one? 
Rolf, you're muted. You're muted, Rolf. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Um, the fact is, there are no solid costs that we can understand at this point in the first Moffat, well, in the only published and publicly available Moffat and Nickel study, there were cost figures included, but they were admittedly um, very preliminary and without any strong authority. So yes, in that round, at that iteration, it was more costly to do it on Mac point or they, they claimed but it was not a reliable figure and they're not standing behind those figures and we have yet to see new numbers. Which um, I just wanna uh, interject that there was no uh, statement of, or any analysis of what the cost of mitigation would be um, uh, for Sears Island. Uh, and of course there wouldn't be mitigation costs for Mac Point because it's already developed. So there's a whole, while the report indicates it's less expensive on Sears Island. They've left out um, uh, you know, infrastructure and mitigation uh, from their costs. So um, it, it's unlikely to be significantly different, I don't believe. Um, and it, does, and it, doesn't, it doesn't say so in the Moffat and Nichols. And Steve, you have something to say. Well, just to build on, on both of those are excellent points. Um, uh, another reason that was, as I mentioned in that slide or showed in the, that slide, Another reason to prefer Sears Island by the Department of Transportation is that it offers more room for expansion. Mac Point has sufficient space for its offshore wind uh, facility and some expansion too. In fact, um, uh, Jim Terrio from Sprague Energy has made that point during the offshore wind uh, public advisory group meetings. On the other hand, it doesn't have uh, over 300 acres <laughs> of land available for expansion. And uh, while that was mentioned as a criteria or as a benefit for developing Sears Island, Moffat and Nickel, Matt Burns has also made that point more than once. So, um, and in our review of internal communications, uh, the magnitude or uh, the grandiose magnitude of proposals for uh, this development uh, would, would really benefit from more space at Sears Island. Uh, that's actually one of the reasons that we're quite concerned about being on Sears Island. Uh, the next question that we had um, was about uh, mercury, but I think you may have answered that, Steve, that the um, analysis was that the, that the soils in the dredged area could be used um, on uh, land. So I think I'm gonna skip to the next question. Um, could we address the pros and cons of using Eastport versus Searsport. Um, and I think Rolf, you probably should answer that one since you were there, you went down. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I think an advantage of, of Eastport is that at the exist, there, there is the land there and it's available. Um, the Eastport Port Authority has expressed a very strong interest in having this uh, port there. They have not had any cargo traffic through Eastport for a few years. It was envisioned to bring wood chips through and they were spent a few million dollars on warehousing and a big conveyor system that has really almost never been used. Um, the big advantage of Searsport is there's 65 feet of water that would require absolutely no dredging. And there would probably be, you know, less probably environmental damage there, there was reference to the possibility that one of the um, salmon pens that's in the area might need to be relocated, um, but that was really the, the ma a major barrier. Um, and I guess the only other thing I would say is that Eastport is farther away by some 75 to 100 miles. I don't know the exact distance. So towing these behemoth floating wind turbines becomes more costly. And I, I suppose there's some risk involved in that too, towing that much farther. Thanks. Um, I think there's also the issue of the fact that leaving the a port of Eastport, you have to cross uh, into Canadian waters. Um, yeah, but that was pretty much minimized because any okay. shipping that had been done through there, there, there are treaties in place that make it very easy to do. 
you know, I, again, I'm not, I'm certainly not a, a marine engineer, so I don't know the ins and outs. I, you know, it, it does look like it would be a, a difficult place to, to get through, but they say it can be done. So I'm, I'll take the experts um, at their word. <laughs> I think the next question, unless I'm missing one, is that the Pilot Association is suggesting, I think you mean Sears Island is less, uh, is safer than Mac Point, um, that, which is a statement that I've heard uh, from them. Um, and I don't know if either of you want to address that. I think well, that was for it, storm surge or something. Well, no, it was for this this concept. I mean, you can probably describe it better, Steve, but it was like the prevailing winds. So the, the Pilots Association, as represented by David Gelinas, who is a tug captain, and, and I think he's he's on the offshore windport advisory group with Steve and me and and 16 other people. Um, but he made the point that the way ships have to be brought into Mac Point, that the, I can't even remember the name. What, what is the term, Steve? That fetch. The fetch, you know, the fetch of the, the wind and the waves pushing boats in a certain direction introduces uh, a dimension of risk that again, I'm not in a position to comment on. Although Jim Terrio from, from Sprague and some others have, minimize this issue saying number one that's a factor in a very short periods of time during the summer with those southern uh, uh, prevailing winds coming from the south and the, the southwest so it really shouldn't be an issue and in fact there were strategies considered of resituating the piers at mac point for this purpose in a way that would be you know resolve some of that issue just a little anecdote here. I, I was almost amused when I heard uh, Dave Jelinas mention that as a, as in his view anyway, a particularly important factor. Um, and and you know it, it it's one factor among any number of different uh, issues that ought to be looked at. But but fetch was uh, attempted to be used as an issue in the cargo port development uh, applications and. Uh, 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 the attorneys working on that at the time uh, absolutely shredded the, uh, the the claim that it would be a problem uh, because there just simply are very few days out of any given year when the wind out of the south is going to be a problem. And that's the only wind that really is a problem. Um, also, I'd like to point out that uh, ferries, including the Islesboro Ferry, draw, uh, run broadside to fetch. <laughs> every single day and uh, many times a day. And, um, and it's rare for the boats to not be able to run because of fetch on, on the West Bay. So um, yeah, you got to look at it. And you know, I don't want to uh, claim to be a, a, a major marine uh, expert, but, um, but uh, it, it, it's a red herring in my view. Um, not only that, though, but as Rolf mentioned, there may be a possibility of reorienting a K so that it's perpendicular, uh, I mean, excuse me, so that it's parallel north-south to the, to the fetch rather than perpendicular um, east-west. So um, it's just, I think, something that, you know, legitimately needs to be looked at, but is, uh, is not likely to be a particularly major factor at all. Prevailing winds, as most people do know, in Penobscot Bay are really, uh, the, the, the real damaging winds are out of the, uh, the Northwest. And now lately, um, often out of the Southeast. Yes, um, Southeast is, seems to be coming around a bit more <laughs> these days, at least from this perspective, I live on North Haven Island. Um, so uh, are there further questions? Have I missed any questions? Um, I, I did want to just mention a couple of things. Um, I was hoping that Matt um, Cannon, our staffer, who is also serving on the Offshore Wind um, Port Advisory Group, would be able to speak. Um, but he is, uh, unfortunately, on another call. Um, but I, I do think that um, it's very interesting to note um, that there have been 
uh, the, the main Department of Transportation has offered a, um, an, an advisory group uh, opportunity, um, and uh, I, I could put it in the chat, but it's it. Um, both Steve and Rolf serve on that along with, um, with Matt Cannon from Sierra Club. Um, and uh, they have been looking at or supposedly evaluating um, Sears Island and Mac Point and other alternatives. However, um, they have only looked at Sears Island. They have not done any of the due diligence that needs to be done on Mac Point yet um, in terms of soil analysis and other things. And uh, there is not going to be any report uh, before the final meeting, which I believe is December 12th. Um, yeah, let's clarify that though, because right. I mean, it is generally expected to be the last meeting, but it has not been stated there is a possibility that there could be another meeting after the first of the year. It seems unlikely, but it's possible. I do see there are a couple of other questions here. One is from Beverly about beyond the site itself, what else might be needed for MDOT to develop the acres? And on, on Sears Island itself, you're right. Uh, the, the footprint of the port itself would be that 100 acres, give or take, and probably give. Or take and to get there there they would need to build a new road along that western shore from the causeway to the site and so that would be new the the plan that was initially stated indicated that the existing road which many of you might be familiar with we call it the jetty road that you know kind of goes up the spine of the island and curves to the west that road would be a secondary access to the site and the primary one would be going through the woods. So I've been told. Uh, Eastport no longer has rail and, and, you know, I think, again, Steve might have other information, but what I'm understanding is that for the, for the marshalling port, there wouldn't be much if anything, coming in by land, either by truck or by rail, that the steel, the concrete, the generators, the blades and so forth, those would all be arriving by ship. So rail is not necessarily an advantage in terms of this marshalling port. For Sears port, it definitely is an advantage for other types of cargo in through, through uh, Mac Point and the Sprague Terminal there, but it's not for the marshalling port. Um, well, um, I wonder if there are any further questions. Um, did you answer, I, I'm sorry, I missed Beverly's uh, that's all right. question before, but um, are there any other questions that I have missed? Uh, uh -huh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, and I guess I'd, I'd like to dive into that one. As someone who makes at least a yearly trip to Sears Island, my wife, this is the first time we've heard much of anything regarding the issue. Now, December is not a deadline. You know, it is when the next meeting of this Windport Advisory Group will meet. And it's a two-hour Zoom meeting, which both, you know, Steve and I and others have discussed. That's a really brief period of time to get whatever new information we're going to get because it's a very complex decision. But as I think Steve also mentioned, the Winport Advisory Group is not being asked to vote or to make a decision on what the group itself believes is the best place for this. We are as individuals representing our stakeholder groups and um, I have been frustrated. They stated at the outset that they would conduct, I believe it, they were saying a robust and transparent stakeholder engagement process. And that has not happened. The Department of Energy, Department of Energy, Maine DOT has really taken very few steps at all to publicize and make public the information that, you know, that. And I've been frustrated by it. I actually wanted to um, 
I proposed to the Searsport town manager, the Stockton town manager, both of whom are part of the Windport advisory group. And then there's also a Searsport resident that is on the, um, on the, the group. I propose that we hold a public meeting in Searsport and invite people to come and see. And I got no response from them. And, you know, as a resident of Searsport and a taxpayer, I'm, I'm kind of bothered by that. And I think, I think the people in Searsport and Stockton Springs and Belfast and the neighboring communities need to understand what's happening here. And I wanna go back and reemphasize that I personally, and on behalf of Friends of Sears Island, we support all efforts to achieve energy, you know, re renewable energy. But I, you know, we think it can be done, you know, in Sears Sport, but people need to know it's gonna happen. And, and that's what we're trying to do. Go oh, Steve. Yeah, I'd like to just sort of follow up a little bit on that, Rolf, and and uh, and on uh, answering or addressing the question here. Um, I, uh, as I tried to to point out in the presentation, and I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of uh, applications, formal applications, and that's when things get really uh, uh, well. That's when decisions, formal decisions, can be made and will be made. And we have every reason to believe that a formal application uh, for National Environmental Policy Act uh, permit and Clean Water Act permits are forthcoming. One of the reasons that we think that it's very likely that this is going to occur soon in 2023 was that during, um, we were actually interviewed to see whether we were safe to be on the uh, offshore wind public advisory stakeholder group. Um, this, kind of, uh, I found amusing, but anyway. So during this interview process, which was conducted by a Department of Transportation representative, a uh, woman named Kay Rand, as well as by um, uh, two representatives from a, uh, 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 a consulting company, uh, we were being asked some, some questions about uh, our, our views on uh, Sears Island and the offshore wind proposal. Moffat and Nickel report. And so I had a few questions for them, um, which I think was rather startling um, from their standpoint. But one of my questions was whether they had initiated any scoping discussions with the Army Corps engineers or other federal agencies. And the representative from the consulting company that was part of the Zoom conversation began to say, oh yeah, we've, we've, we've begun those scoping and was immediately interrupted and to, uh, essentially uh, uh, told to be quiet by the Department of Transportation representative. So um, we did learn in that, that in fact, that scoping process, it's a very initial phase of, uh, of, of formally applying for federal permits to do this kind of activity. So um, with that in mind, um, and, and um, so far only a minimal amount of evidence in the, in the transmissions that we've been receiving, uh, email copies and so forth from Traverse Transportation. But we do have every reason to believe that this permitting process is, is relatively imminent and uh, will require a great deal of uh, uh, support from you all. And uh, that's when, um, you know, especially then um, is when, uh, your voice is is important and we need to hear from you and we hope that you will be talking about um about the matter uh frequently and with as many people as you could a couple more questions there i want to comment of course about lawsuits sounds like mdot and the governor have their mindset which is kind of our position that that, that although we are told repeatedly that no decision has been made. Clearly with the background documentation that Steve brought forward tonight, that was the intent really from the beginning before any of us were brought into the process. So the other question is what Sprague's position on using Mac Point and all the changes? And, you know, uh, I was told, uh, David Italiander, who was uh, on the board of Friends of Sears Island, did the tour last Friday of Mac Point, and he reported that he understood that Sprague um, 
was very interested in the, the idea of the, the port being the wind port marshalling port being cited there and that at every point uh, in the discussion and you know and things that that MDOT said might be problems he had solutions for you know that it's no worry to move the tanks it's no worry to move the dry storage warehousing so you know our understanding is that Sprague is certainly strongly willing to engage on this and to be the site if it can happen. So, uh, um, let's see. So how, how will you be informed um, with permitting updates and when your efforts may be needed? Um, well, one of the things we will plan to do is anyone who, is, who signs up expressing interest through our um, <coughs> add-up campaign, we will be uh, contacting you um, when the permitting process begins. And we'll also be on our website. I think uh, Friends of Sears Island will have it on their website and so will Islesboro Island Trust. I'm going to put in the chat again the um, the add up campaign that Sierra Club um, has organized, um, and that allows us to um, capture a way of communicating with you um, going forward. I expect that we will be delivering petition signatures to the governor, and um, also talking about um, you know going forward what our activities will be sometime in the new year. Um, and uh, you know there the permitting process we hope will be a robust permitting process. I think we need to hold the Army Corps of Engineers accountable for um, you know, actually doing the NEPA uh, evaluation. They have expressed um, frequently uh, that they do not like to do EISs, but um, they we shall as um, citizens ask them to follow through on an EIS, which is an environmental impact statement, um, because it's going to be needed. And we will have the help of, as uh, Steve mentioned, Kyla Bennett, who is part of the um, uh, Public Employees in, uh, for Environmental Responsibility Organization. She has been a whistleblower herself and is a lawyer, and uh, they will uh, be doing their best to hold uh, the state accountable for all of the analyses that need to be done. I'd just like to add, uh, that was great, Becky, but I just want to add that um, I for, for thoroughly uh, encourage all of you to badger us. Go ahead and uh, make sure that you know what you need to know when you need to know it. We will be trying to do that. And I think that, you know, um, most people will be aware through press releases and, and uh, internal communications for all of our organizations. But just in case, get in touch. I'm putting my email address in the chat if anybody wants to email me directly. You know, I'd be very happy. I also put the info at Friends of Sears Island email address, which is another thing. The Friends of Sears Island does have a resource page. There's a link right from the home page of our actually quite beautiful new website. <laughs> um, uh, that also has a, a link to a, you know, a, a video, kind of a virtual tour of Sears Island, and it'll show you, a actually there is a, a one part of it where it shows you where the wind port would be located, and it's a densely forested area, so you'll get a sense of the perspective if, you're, if you've not been there or haven't been there recently. Um, I want to just um, note that it is after 7 o'clock, and it's 7.04. Uh, six and so I you know we don't want to hold people longer than they are yeah. interested in staying but um, if there are further questions please throw them in the chat and um, Matt Cannon is our um, chapter staffer who also would be happy to um, to follow, follow through on any kind of questioning or um, also give you any kind of new information that we would have um, and we have uh, I, I also put a regular email address for the chapter main.chapter at sierraclub.org in the chat as well. And um, 
my inbox is so bad that I'm hoping that the chapter will send me questions <laughs> directly. So I'm not giving you mine. <laughs> but um, if, uh, want, if folks want to stay on a little bit longer, great. Um, otherwise, I just want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, Wazumpkig is a beautiful spot um, in the Bay, um, living down here a little bit uh, south of uh, and south and west of Searsport, um, I can say that I can see Sears Island from the west shore of North Haven. And what happens on Sears Island and in the upper part of Penobscot Bay affects everyone who um, benefits from the resources we have in this bay. Uh, I think there's a lot of effort that is, has occurred to try to preserve the bay, but there's also a lot of effort that is going on right now to industrialize and add more um, effluence into the bay that we are trying to, you know, to highlight the resources that we benefit from. So I, I hope all of you will enjoy Penobscot Bay and please feel free to contact all of us. The recording will be available, yes, um, on the Sierra Club website. It'll probably take a couple of days for us to get it up, um, but please be patient. And if you're having trouble, get in touch with me, please. Um, and I'll make sure that it, it, it gets out soon. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate your kind attention, wonderful questions, and, and interest. So thank thanks you. for thanks everyone for joining. And I'm glad that we um, introduced it to new people. And uh, feel free to ask ask away. Thank you.